I'm going to welcome up the man of the day, your favourite Archbishop of 2018. <laughs> Hi everyone, it's nice to know that I'm the favourite, your favourite Catholic Archbishop of Perth at the moment, seeing as there is only one, but anyway. Um, look, it's great to be here, uh, to see so many of you have gathered. I didn't wasn't too sure if anyone would come on a long weekend, so congratulations. I'm sure lots of you might have been able to do lots of other things, but it's great to have you here. You might have worked out by now that we've had a bit of trouble with our IT, uh, so I have this stunning PowerPoint presentation <laughs> that it took me hours to put together. Um, so if you need a copy of it, you better send me an email and I'll forward it to you. But uh, what I'm going to have to do is uh, just work from the slides myself. I don't have a script. I was just going to talk to the slides, uh, and that's fine. You'll just have to imagine, if you can. I might even describe the slides for you so that you know what you're missing out on. But the topic that I was asked to talk about I was, uh, was sort of suggested to me. I proposed one thing, and of course, they always tell you to do something different. But uh, I really wanted to use the topic, or talk about the topic, living as disciples of Jesus in a society which does not know him. That was my original intention. Living as disciples of Jesus in a society that does not know him. And we changed that a little bit uh, to following Jesus in a secular society. But by secular society, I just want you to have in your minds that what I'm really talking about is a society that by and large isn't interested in Jesus at all. And how do we live as disciples of Jesus in a society that's really not particularly interested in who he is, what he's on about, what it means to follow him, what the joys might be, what the challenges might be. So those of us who in one way or another have decided that we want to follow him or at least we're interested in, in exploring it a bit further, we need to understand right at the start that we're living in a society which actually doesn't help us particularly to do that. Some of you have heard me say this before, but this is different to what it was like for me when I was your age. Because when I was your age, and a bit younger also, uh, when I'm thinking now about when I was still at school in primary and secondary school, um, the values that my mum and dad, my family was on about, we were a, a, a typical average Catholic family, the values that they were on about and the values that the school, both my primary school and my secondary school were on about, were pretty much the same as the values of the society in which we were living. In the 19... Well, I was born in 1954. So in the 1960s, certainly, and into the 1970s, the society's values hadn't changed as dramatically as they have done in the last 20 years. And so what that means is our society doesn't support the choice of those who want to follow Jesus. So straight away that tells you something and it tells you that you're going to need a lot of courage, you're going to need a, not, need a lot of conviction, you're going to need a lot of support and you're going to have to be prepared for quite a few challenges along the way. Now, in saying that to you, I'm sure I'm not telling you something you don't already know. But I think it's important for us to recognise, and in saying this, I don't want to sound like I'm sort of totally negative about our society because there are lots and lots of fantastic things about our society. But it's not a society any longer, and it's becoming less and less so as each day goes by, that builds itself on the traditional Christian values of our Christian and Catholic faith. So it's just good for us to recognise that because that puts the, the, sets the scene, if you like, for the question, well, how do we follow Jesus in a society that doesn't particularly help us? And there are some of the questions that I wanted to tackle today. But I really wanted to talk about three things, really. The first one is... Why would we want to follow Jesus in the first place? Now, in some sense, many of you have already answered that question for yourselves or might be in the process of answering that question for yourselves, but maybe other people in your family 
haven't answered that question or aren't even interested in asking it. Certainly many of, many of your friends, people that you're in contact with in one way or another, they won't see the value of this decision that you have made or that we have made to want to follow Jesus. And they might say to you, why would you even want to do that in the first place? So I think that's a question that's really worth reflecting on and thinking about and I wanted to say a couple of things about that. The second thing that I want to just uh, raise briefly, because we've only got about half an hour together for the talk and then there's question and answers, but the second question would be, on the basis of the first one, well, what does it actually mean to follow Jesus? Now, we might think we know the answer to that and maybe we do, but maybe there might be dimensions to the following of Jesus that we haven't yet thought about which might surprise us, might challenge us, might even frighten us a little bit or on the other hand might give us great enthusiasm and great encouragement and great happiness in our lives. So what does it actually mean? What does it look like in practice? How can you spot a disciple of Jesus in the crowd? How could people spot you in the crowd and say to themselves, look, that person must be a disciple of Jesus. And then the third question, and it's very much related to the second one, is how do we help each other to follow Jesus? Because if there's one thing that I've learnt and I become more sure of as each day goes by, it is that you can't do it on your own and you're not supposed to do it on your own. So they're the three questions that I wanted to, to weave my little talk around this afternoon. So the first question, why would we want to follow Jesus in the first place? This is perhaps the most basic of the faith questions that we could ask ourselves. It really is a very fundamental question and it's actually got three parts to it for us as Catholics. I presume most of you here are Catholics and those who aren't are nevertheless very interested in the Christian story and the Christian faith. But for us in the Catholic tradition, there are always three dimensions to this question of following Jesus. And the first, well really they all come under that great big heading that you know, apparently we're supposed to be reflecting on all the time. What is the meaning of life? That's a big question. But I think for us, in terms of what we're doing here this afternoon, there are three things. And the first is the question of God. And if I had one of these stunning slides up there on the screen, the question would be, God, yes or no? Now this is a, a fundamental question that in some senses has no longer been asked or is no longer being asked in our society. But we have to grapple with it for ourselves and for uh, the decisions we make about our lives. Is there a God or isn't there? That's the first question. I presume we wouldn't be here if we hadn't already answered that question. But of course it would lead you immediately to the second question, who is this God whom we believe uh, exists? So that really leads us to, for us as Catholics, as Christians, to the second question, Jesus Christ, divine Son of God, yes or no? So if there is a God, that's the first thing, then the second question for us as Catholics is, is Jesus Christ, that man who lived about 2,000 years ago, who suffered terribly, who died a horrible death and whom we believe rose from the dead, is he, was he and is he the divine son of God? In other words, both fully human like us and yet at the same time God. That's a very fundamental question that we have to ask if we're going to want to journey along this path of discipleship because we've got to have a reason for following Jesus. And if the only reason for following Jesus is that, oh, well, he was a good bloke who did a few great things 2,000 years ago, that's not enough to keep us going. There's got to be more to Jesus than that. And then the third question is, and this, I think, is the tricky... Well, they're all tricky, 
but this is the more tricky one for many people today. So the God question, the Jesus question, and then the third question is the church question. The church as the body of Christ and the sacrament of salvation, yes or no. And in our Catholic tradition, those three questions all belong to each other and we can't sideline one because it's too hard or too challenging or we don't really want to have to deal with it. And they're all essential to this question of following Jesus and become particularly problematic and especially the third one in a society which isn't particularly interested in knowing about Jesus. So, God, yes or no? Jesus Christ as divine Son of God, yes or no? The church as the body of Christ and the sacrament, that is the living, effective, powerful sign of salvation, yes or no? Well, let's just go back to the first one and again, I'll just have to get you to use your imaginations because I've got this beautiful slide of... uh, uh, taken by the Hubble telescope or something, of of some part of the universe, and beside it I've got a quote from one of the Psalms. So if you can have in your mind's eye all those photos you've seen of the universe and just think of these words from one of the Psalms. When I see the heavens, the work of your hands, the moon and the stars which you arranged, who are we? that you should keep us in mind. Mere men and women, that you care for us. When I see the heavens, the work of your hands, the moon and the stars which you arranged. It's always been a real puzzle to me how astronomers, scientists, you know, the um, Brian Coxes of this... Is it Brian Cox? Yeah, the Brian Coxes of this world can be so immersed in the extraordinary universe of which we're a part and not be falling on their knees in adoration of the God who made it. I, I don't get it. <clears throat> While some people would seem to suggest that the vastness of the universe and what they would describe as the tiny, insignificant little speck which is our earth, and we measly little human beings who are, you know, these little creatures that run around on this insignificant speck in this insignificant corner of the universe, that seems to some people to say, well, how could there possibly be a God? It says exactly the opposite to me. How could you possibly not believe in God when you see the heavens, the moon and the stars, and ask yourself, how? How could this be? So when I was a a lecturer in theology in Melbourne and also over here at Notre Dame at one stage in my illustrious career, I used to send students home at the end of their first lecture in the introduction to theology with some homework. And the homework was on the first clear night, go out into the backyard, lie on your back, and spend some time looking up into the sky and then ask yourself, who is God that what I can see is the mere, merest fraction of what God has created? So for me, the question, God, yes or no, is easy to answer. doesn't mean it's easy to understand, but it's easy to answer. I'm going to presume that you agree with me that there is a God. If you don't, you can ask about it at the end, but at the moment, let's just accept for, the, uh, for argument's sake, if I can put it that way, that there is a God. The answer we give to that question, if we take it seriously, absolutely changes everything about our lives. And I think that's one of the reasons why so many people in our society don't want to ask the question or think about the question because if you do and you come up with the answer, yes, there is, then everything changes. You can't look at yourself or your life or your world or anything in the same way 
once you accept that there is a God and God has brought all of this into existence and is responsible for keeping it in existence. In other words, our life absolutely depends on God who's given it to us. That's the inevitable implication of giving a yes to that question, God, yes or no. If, on the other hand, I say, no, there's not, then I'm left with a major challenge and that is, how do I make any sense of anything and find any meaning in anything, particularly things like suffering, if there's no God? So I just want to leave that with you, but I think that's the first and most important question. The next slide is a beautiful slide. It has a lovely picture of Pope Francis. He's got a big smile on his face and he's going like this. And beside it, I've got a whole lot of little uh, uh, things that are planted in the ground with the word yes written on all of them. So you can picture that if you like. <laughs> and beside it, I've, I've got these words. If I say yes, then the existence of God will influence everything. If I say yes and take it seriously, if it's not just a, oh yeah, I guess so, but if I say yes and then think about what that means, it will influence everything I do, everything I believe, everything I try to make of myself. I'm a bit older than most of you guys. You're still in the process of making your lives. You're creating your lives and your futures. Most of mine's behind me. But... Uh, everything that you decide you want to make of yourself will be different if you say yes to the question, is there a God? There's a great figure who's a very attractive figure for uh, young people in our church and that's blessed Pier Giorgio Frassati. Some of you will know about Pier Giorgio Frassati. Some of you came with me to the place uh, where he is buried, except he wasn't there because he'd gone to Poland for World Youth Day. So he decided to not hang around while we were on our way there. But we went to visit him in Turin. He said something once, I think, that's very, very significant and you might just try and, and hold it in your minds. To live without faith, to live without something to defend, without a steady struggle for truth, that's not living, that's just existing. To live without faith, without something to defend, without a steady struggle for the truth, that is not living, it's just existing. And lots of people, I would say, and this might be a bit judgmental, but I think lots of people aren't really living their lives, they're just existing. Another way of saying that is they're actually living on the surface and refusing to have the courage to go a bit deeper. And I think if there was one way I would describe the trend of our society, it's that. People are distracting themselves and filling their lives with all sorts of things so that they can just exist on the surface and not go deeper. Real living is about going deeper. So Pope Francis once used this quote of Pierre Giorgio Frassati and then he asked the question, do we want to just exist or do we want to really live? Remember what I'm wanting to do here, I'm wanting to say that if we're going to follow Jesus, we've got three questions to grapple with and the first one is this question of God. I've got to be careful I don't spend the whole time talking about that, so I'll move on uh, to Jesus in a moment. But just be aware, as I'm sure you are, that there are all kinds of different ways of thinking about God and all kinds of ways in which people try to explain who God is or what God is all about. Some people think of God, these are cliches in a way, you know, and so cliches uh, can be a bit... Um, unhelpful in one sense, but cliches are cliches because there's some truth in them. So some people talk about the watchmaker God. The watchmaker God is the God who got everything up and running at the start 
like the person who, who puts a, all the bits and pieces together to make a watch, winds it up and then goes away and leaves it and the clock just ticks away. Some people think that's what God is like. God got it all going, God's created everything, but God is no longer engaged, no longer interested. God's walked away and is busy doing something else and has no more interest in the world. That's not the God that we in our Christian and Catholic faith believe in. Other people think about God as what the scientists often call, those who aren't particularly religious, the God of the gaps. That is, the God that you call on when you can't find any other explanation for something. So you say, well, I can't understand it, so it must be due to God. But the problem with that is as science progresses, there are fewer and fewer gaps. There'll always be some. But is God really a, an idea we just sort of latch onto when we can't come up with any better explanation? That kind of God is not going to be a God that we can commit our lives to and build our lives on. Or some people think about the impersonal God. A little bit like the watchmaker God, but the God who doesn't really care about us. Or maybe the God who's not personal at all, but just a, I don't know, a life force or, you know, the, the, like, like in Star Wars, you know, the force be with you, that kind of thing. But not, not a personal kind of God with whom you can have a relationship. Some people think of God as an angry or vengeful or capricious God. You know, we've got to be careful of this God because if we put a step wrong, God's ready to get us. So not much room for a loving God, not much room for a forgiving God and a compassionate God, but a kind of a policeman God who's just waiting for us to make a mistake and then he's going to get us. That's certainly not the God that Jesus talks about in the Gospels. So then there is the God that Jesus talks about in the Gospels, that loving, that compassionate, that merciful God, the God who is revealed not just in what Jesus says, but in what Jesus does. This goes back now to our second question. Jesus Christ, divine Son of God, yes or no? If the answer is yes, then what we see in Jesus is the human expression of the divine heart and will and mind. So when Jesus deals with someone, we're seeing in a human context the way God deals with us. And if we have time, I can talk about a few stories from the Gospels to illustrate that. But the point is that if Jesus is in fact the divine son of God, as our Catholic tradition and the general Christian tradition says he is, then he actually lets us into the secret of what God is actually like. This is really important because one of the fundamental questions I think about people who are thinking about following Jesus or people who are reflecting on their decision to follow Jesus is, do I know him really and do I believe him? How well do you know Jesus, really? And how deeply do you trust Jesus, really? Because following Jesus is about knowing him and then, even more importantly, trusting him. Those of you who came with us uh, to Poland for World Youth Day uh, will remember how deeply embedded in the Polish culture is the divine mercy um, devotion. And the image, that some of you have heard me say this before, but the image that we often see of the divine mercy is, is of Jesus with the rays coming from his hands and underneath the inscriptions, Jesus, I trust in you. And I remember saying at the time, talking to some of our young people when we were there, I feel more comfortable with leaving out the word in in that sentence, Jesus, I trust you. And then people like Father Marius here, who comes from Poland, were able to tell me that actually that's the better translation of the Polish. So it shouldn't be, Jesus, I trust you. So next time you go into a church, don't do this. 
but you know you could go and just scrub out the inn, <laughs> and we'd have a, we'd be a bit closer to the truth. Jesus, I trust you. Imagine, think what that means when you say it to someone. I trust you. It means I'm I'm prepared to risk everything. I'm prepared to hand myself over to you. I feel confident in giving myself to you. Jesus, I trust you. So how well do we know him? And how truly do we trust him? Today we're celebrating the solemnity of the body and blood of the Lord, Corpus Christi. There's a great story, you'll all know it, you'll all remember it in chapter 6 of St John's Gospel, which is the chapter in St John's Gospel where Jesus talks about himself as the bread of life. And it's a very long chapter. If you get a chance when you get home or some other time in the next few days or weeks, read it through. It kind of gets more explicit as it goes along. And the scripture scholars will tell us that when you get to the point where Jesus says, Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, the word that he uses is the word for munch, chew. So it's not figurative language, it's literal language. At the end of John's Gospel, we're told that a whole lot of Jesus' disciples, not just those who were hanging around uh, interested in what he was saying, a whole lot of Jesus' disciples no longer walked with him. In other words, they stopped being disciples because they just couldn't cope with what he was saying. It was too hard. How could this man give give us his flesh to eat? This is stupid. This is against all logic and reason. What did Jesus do? He didn't say, oh, sorry, look, come back. You misunderstood. I didn't really mean it. Of course I didn't mean it. What I meant was I wanted to be really close to you and a friend of yours. He didn't call them back. He turned to his closest disciples and he said to them, well, what about you? Are you going to walk away too? And Simon Peter spoke up. He's the leader. He always is the one who speaks on behalf of the group. He says, Lord, to whom would we go? You have the words of life. Do we believe him? When I became the Archbishop here in Perth, this is another one of those beautiful slides you're not getting to see, um, <laughs> I changed the motto that I'd chosen when I first became a bishop in Melbourne um, five or six years before that. When I was a bishop in Melbourne, I chose a motto, and I'm sure you're all very good at Latin here, so I'll give it to you in Latin. Qui manet in caritate in Deo manet. Oh, no, that don't you? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> that means, that comes from one of St John's letters, the one who lives in love lives in God. That was the motto I chose when I became a bishop. When I came to Perth and we had to change the crest on my coat of arms, I decided it was a good chance to change the motto as well. So I changed it to three simple words. Via, veritas, vita. The way, the truth, the life. Because I wanted to make the heart of my time as the Archbishop of Perth uh, a time when I tried to help us all focus on him, put him at the heart of everything. Because he is the way he says, he says, and that's the question, do we trust him? Do we believe him? Can you take him at his word? He says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. Now, if we're going to be his disciples, we then are saying to ourselves and to him, well, we're going to walk in your way. We're going to commit ourselves and believe in your truth and we're going to live the life that you give us. I'm not going to choose my own way anymore, I'm going to follow your way. I'm not going to, to, you know, choose anything I believe in and change every five minutes if it doesn't suit me, I'm going to commit myself to your truth. And I'm going to live the kind of life that comes to me from you as a gift through my life of discipleship. That's what uh, the importance of Jesus is and why the question, Jesus Christ, divine son of God, yes or no, that's why it's so important. What does following the way 
and believing the truth and living the life of Jesus look like in a society which is not particularly interested in knowing anything about him? Well, one of the things it's probably going to mean is that we will have to make choices that are very different to the choices of a society which is following other people or other philosophies or other religious ideas or other uh, moral values or whatever. That leads me to... I'm speeding up here a little bit, as you'll realise. That leads me to the third part of this three-part question. First one, God, yes or no? Jesus Christ, divine Son of God, yes or no? And the third part, the church as the body of Christ and the sacrament of salvation, yes or no? There are a couple of phrases that I want to just pick out and leave with you and you can hunt them up in your New Testaments uh, at another time. And one is from the letter to the Philippians. And I want to just give these to you, three or four scriptures, scripture quotes, which I think will build up a bit of a picture, which might frighten us in a way, will certainly challenge us, but I think does help us understand what the way looks like, what the truth looks like, and what the life of Christ looks like. So the first one is from the letter to the Philippians, where St Paul says to the Philippians, you must have in you the same mind that was in Christ Jesus. Do you want to know what being a Christian looks like? It looks like someone who thinks the thoughts of Jesus, who thinks the way Jesus thinks, whose attitudes are the same as the attitudes of Jesus, whose heart, if you like, is the same as the heart of Jesus. If you don't feel... um, I don't see too many of you shifting uncomfortably in your seats. I'm a bit worried you're not taking me seriously. How many of us could say, absolutely, I have the mind of Jesus. I never think any thought that Jesus would never have thought. I never treat anybody any differently than Jesus would have treated them. But that's what being a disciple of Jesus is all about. So that's the first one. You must have in you the same mind and heart, I've got in brackets, that was in Christ Jesus. This would be if this was the first lecture in a whole series on, uh, you know, an introduction to Christianity or something, where we would then go to the Gospels and we would try to uncover the mind of Jesus, the attitudes of Jesus, and learn from him how you're supposed to react in particular situations. And that's a really important thing to do, and I really encourage you to do it, because a disciple of Jesus will be one who's, <coughs> pardon me, doing his or her best to think the thoughts of Jesus, to see, if you like, with the eyes of Jesus, to listen with the ears of Jesus, to speak with the voice of Jesus, to love with the heart of Jesus. But it's only by really knowing the Jesus of the Gospels that we can even work out how close or how far away we are from that ideal. Maybe you can see why when I became the Archbishop I changed my motto to put Jesus absolutely at the heart of my understanding of my mission and my ministry as the Archbishop here. We've got to put Jesus back at the heart of our lives and we've got to put Jesus back at the heart of our uh, church. And if, if anything I can say or do while I'm the Archbishop helps that to happen then I won't be too embar- I'll be embarrassed, but I won't be too embarrassed uh, when I get to heaven and the Lord says, what did you do for me? One of the challenges here, and we don't have time to go into it in too much detail, but one of the challenges here is to have the courage to, to check whether or not my instincts are the instincts of Jesus. When I encounter someone who sees things differently, for example, or when I encounter someone who I think is not living the sort of life that they should be living, what's my instinct? How do I treat that person? Do I get angry? Do I walk away from them in disgust? Do I start lecturing them about what they should be doing? What's my instinct? 
What's my kind of default position if I wasn't thinking it through beforehand? And then ask yourself, but if I were trying to be a disciple of Jesus and think his thoughts and speak his words and listen with his ears and see with his eyes, would it look any different? I won't go into the stories, but think for a few minutes or think later on about two or three stories. Think of the story of that little man Zacchaeus. Remember the story of Zacchaeus? Who climbs up into the tree to see Jesus because he's so short he can't see him over the crowd and Jesus is visiting town and Zacchaeus probably got a a celebrity complex and wants to see this famous person. We all know the story. Zacchaeus is despised in that town because he's a tax collector. Everyone thinks he's cheating them. He hasn't got any friends. He's rejected. He's on the margins. Jesus spots him up in the tree and Jesus doesn't say to him, Zacchaeus, you're not a very good person. You're not doing the right thing. Get down here so I can tell you what you should be doing. Don't you realise that you shouldn't be doing this, that or the other? What does, he do? what does he say? He says, Zacchaeus, come down. I'm coming to your place for tea tonight. Would that have been... Is that our instinct when we come across someone who challenges us because we think they're on the wrong path? But, of course, the point of that story is that a man who is despised and rejected and marginalised and all of those things has no chance of changing until he knows that he's accepted and respected and loved. He's not respected or accepted or loved by anybody in the town, but Jesus respects him and accepts him and loves him. And before Jesus even has a chance to say, now listen, mate, you've got to start thinking about a change in your life, Zacchaeus says, if I've done anything wrong, I'm going to fix it up straight away. The welcome of Jesus changed the man's life before Jesus said anything to him about changing. So this is just one example and the Gospels are full of these things and they're challenging stories and they're beautiful stories but they're confronting stories and they should ask, make us ask ourselves, do I really have the mind and heart of Jesus? Am I really seeing people with his eyes? Am I really speaking his words? Anyway, there's heaps and heaps of those stories. I wanted to throw another very challenging phrase that I'm not quite sure why, but in the last couple of years has grown bigger and bigger in my own thinking. It comes from the letter to the Romans. So you might want to uh, chase it down at some stage. It's in chapter 12 of the letter to the Romans. I'll read it in the translation that we're used to hearing in the scriptures. Now remember, this is by St Paul. He's writing to a small Christian community living in the context of the Roman world, a world that's not particularly open to the the values of Jesus, a world that's the pagan world of its time. What does Paul say to that Christian community? Because I think what he said to that Christian community, he might also say to us here, if he were here this afternoon. So have a listen to this and just think, what's this asking of me? Adapt yourselves no longer to the patterns of this present world. Adapt yourselves no longer to the patterns of this present world, but let your minds be remade and your whole nature thus transformed. Now, if we're not feeling uncomfortable now, Uh, I think we should be. Because we spend most of our lives adapting ourselves to the patterns of the present world in which we live. We drink in the values of our society in exactly the same way as we breathe in the air that we breathe in every day. We don't even know we're breathing, but we are, otherwise we'd all be dead. We don't consciously breathe in and breathe out. Sometimes you do, but most of the time you don't. You just do it. And it's exactly the same for the influence of our society. We are immersed in a society and a set of values and a way of looking at the world just as we are immersed in an atmosphere which provides us the air we breathe. If we were living in a very polluted city, we would be breathing in the polluted air and getting sick. 
if we live in a society whose values aren't all that they should be, we'll be breathing in, taking in those values and we'll be getting sick. And what Paul is saying is, wake up. Realise that this is the danger. Adapt yourselves no longer to the patterns of this present world, but let your minds be remade. And how's that going to happen? By getting to know Jesus. Let your minds be remade and your whole nature thus transformed. And then what will happen? Paul says, this is what will happen. You will be able to discern, to work out the will of God. And you will know what is good and what is acceptable and what is perfect. But if you don't adapt yourselves no longer to the patterns of the present world, in other words, if you make your decisions and base your life story on the patterns of the present world, there's a good chance that you won't be following what is good and what is acceptable and what is perfect, but heading in a different direction. I won't, we're running out of time, so I won't tell the story, but can I just remind you briefly of the story that's in the Gospels, <coughs> pardon me, of the encounter between Jesus and the rich young man. Remember this story where Jesus is uh, going along somewhere with his disciples and someone, in some versions of the story, it's a rich young man, in other versions it's just a rich man. Uh, but he, this person comes up and he says to Jesus, good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? That's a good question. What must I do? And Jesus says, well, you know, you're a, you're a Jew like me, you know the commandments, you mustn't kill, you mustn't steal, you mustn't commit adultery, you mustn't do this, you mustn't do that. Do these things and you will have life. And then the rich young man said, Master, I have kept all of these things since my earliest youth. I won't ask anybody here to put up their hands and say whether they could say with that confidence what the rich young man said to Jesus. Some of us might be able to, some of us might not be able to. But this man could. I've kept all the commandments since my earliest youth. And then the Gospel says Jesus looked at him and loved him because this was a good man. This was a man who'd lived an upright life. And then Jesus looks him in the eye and he says, you know, there is one thing you lack. Go, sell everything you own, give the money to the poor and then come and follow me and you will have treasure in heaven. And then what I think are perhaps the saddest words almost in the whole gospel tradition uh, are there. It says, the rich man's face fell and he walked away sad because he was a man of great wealth. It's not dissimilar to the story about the disciples who walked away from Jesus because they thought he was talking nonsense. What Jesus was asking was too much for the person or those people because they had already built their life on something else. Now that story, first and foremost, is the story of an encounter between Jesus and one concrete person. So we've got to be careful not to only see in that story a message about the danger of wealth. That's certainly there, but there's more than that in the story. Because the story is really about the thing in that particular person's life that was stopping that person from following Jesus. If Jesus were to walk up to one of you and you were to say, Lord, what do I have to do? And he said, well, you know, you know the rules, the regulations, the commandments. And you said, well, look, I've, even if you can't say I've kept them all, you can say, well, I've really tried hard and I'm not doing too badly at keeping them all. <clears throat> Jesus would look at you and love you and then he would look you in the eye and he would say, if you want to be perfect, then you go and... the rich young man it was his money the real question is what is it for me as Jesus looks me in the eye he says to me if you want to follow me 
if you really want to be my disciple, then you will need to what? That's a fundamental question for anybody who wants to be a disciple of Jesus and it's a much harder question when we live in a society which doesn't support that kind of choice. The last thing that I just wanted to share with you very briefly is uh, how can we help each other to do all of this? Because as I said at the start, we can't do it on our own and we're not supposed to do it on our own. We haven't got time to go into this in too much detail, so let me offer you a couple of passages from Scripture that might help you. This is another passage from the letter to the Philippians in chapter 4 this time. This is some advice, very practical advice, that St Paul gives to his Christians in Philippi. Brothers and sisters, fill your minds with all that is true. Everything that is noble, everything that is good and pure, everything that we can love and honour, everything that can be thought virtuous and worthy of praise. Our society doesn't help us to fill our minds with those kinds of things because so much of what our society is offering us through the uh, internet, through social media, through TV, through our friends, so much of what our society is offering us is the very opposite. So we might need to ask ourselves, if I were to take this advice seriously, what would that look like? What might that kind of be inviting me to change. Fill your minds with everything that is true and noble and good and pure and lovely and honourable and virtuous and worthy of praise. Get rid of all the other stuff in your mind. Don't let any of it in again, but fill your mind with this instead. It's not the role of an archbishop to correct St Paul or to tell him he got it wrong. And I'm certainly not going to do that. But I want to suggest that maybe another way of thinking about what St Paul was saying is this. <clears throat> so I'll rephrase it just slightly. Finally, brothers and sisters, fill your lives with people who are true, people who are noble, people who are good and pure, people whom we can love and honour and people who are virtuous and worthy of praise. Fill your lives with those kinds of people and be the kind of person those kind of people need in their lives so that they can fill their lives with people like, like you, like us. One of the things, and I'll finish with this, one of the things that uh, is at absolutely at the heart of our Christian and Catholic understanding of what it is to be human comes from the first book of the Bible, from the book of Genesis. You know that there are two creation stories in the book of Genesis. The first one, which is where God is presented as a, a kind of an all-powerful transcendent God who just has to say something and it happens. God said, let there be light and there was light. God said, let there be this and there it was. God said, let there be that and there it was. It's this beautiful description of God creating everything. And the last thing God creates is humanity and he creates humanity male and female and he says to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. But before that, we were told, or we are told, that God created human beings in the divine image and likeness. doesn't mean that God is male and female. It means that God, if you look at the story, is a God who gives life, a God who creates. We are made 
in the image and likeness of a life-giving God, not a death-dealing God. We can be the people we're supposed to be when we are bringers of life into each other's lives and we are the very opposite of what God created us to be if we bring death into people's lives. And then in the second creation story, which comes second, but the scholars tell us is a much older story, God is a much more... Uh, presented in a much more kind of human way. He walks in the garden in the evening to keep out of the sun and all of that sort of thing. He creates Adam, the first man. Just Adam, after he's created uh, lots of other things, puts him in the garden and then he feels sorry for him so he decides he needs to give him a helper. So God goes off and he creates all of these animals. This is the way the story is told. And he brings them one by one to the man and the man looks at them and the man gets to name them. So I don't know, maybe God created a a creature that had four legs and a long bushy tail and a great big snout here and the man looked at it and thought, I think I'll call that horse. So anyway, that's the way the story's told. But each time we're told that the man did not find a helper suitable for him. And it's almost as if God gets frustrated. Remember, it's presenting a human sort of image of God. It's almost as if God gets frustrated. He puts the man to sleep. And while the man's asleep, he steals one of his ribs and he builds a woman around the rib and then he wakes the man up and he presents the woman to the man and the man says, this at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. And then we get this extraordinary statement which Jesus then picks up in the New Testament. This is why a man leaves his father and mother and clings to his wife and the two become one. What this is telling us in both of those stories is that God creates us for each other. We're not isolated individuals who just go ahead doing our own thing, thinking that as long as I behave myself, I'll get myself to heaven. I don't need to worry about anybody else. We're made for each other. We're made to depend on each other. We're made to be mutually reliant on each other and mutually responsible for each other. That's built into the nature of God's creation of us uh, in his image. So we need to help each other and we need to look to each other and be able to trust each other to be the people that God has created us to be. So, back to where we started. To be disciples of Jesus in a culture like ours, which has many positive things about it, but which is growing more and more distant from its roots in our Christian uh, tradition, first of all, we have to have grappled with the question, God, yes or no? And for us as Christians, that inevitably leads us to grapple with the question, Jesus Christ, divine son of God, yes or no? And that leads us inevitably to the question of the community that Jesus established. Is that the body of Christ and the sacrament of salvation, the church, yes or no? And if our answer to those three is yes, then it will be within the community of the church, living together, supporting each other, caring for each other, forgiving each other when necessary, all of those things, we will gradually be able to walk this path of discipleship. So the last slide I've got is this beautiful slide (laughs) of Jesus standing at a door and he's knocking on the door. And I've got a little quote beside it from the book of Revelation. I am standing at your door knocking. If you open the door and invite me in, I will sit down with you and eat with you and you with me. So Lord, sit with us and let us sit with you so that we can learn to see as you see and hear as you hear and speak as you speak and love as you love.
Thanks, everyone. Sorry I went a bit over time.